871 miles almost entirely off-road, traveling on roads that take you back in time, crossing mountains that seem to rise out of nowhere, seeing no one for miles and even days, observing civilizations of a long time ago, riding deep into the forest with views in every direction. This is the Utah Backcountry Discovery Route. Our goal is to travel from the Arizona border to Idaho on public access roads that can be used by any off-road vehicle, remaining on as many gravel roads as possible. The Utah Backcountry Discovery Route is the second installation in the BDR series, but its inception was definitely not the second on everyone's mind. We've assembled a team of riders from Washington, Colorado, Idaho, British Columbia, and California. Each one has a skill that is vital to the success of our mission and all the members have come together to make sure it goes according to plan. Paul Gillian of Turretech and president of the Backcountry Discovery Routes has helped find sponsors, rounded up all the equipment, and has made sure this project gets off the ground. Paul is riding a BMW F800GS with a few modifications, a larger fuel tank and an upgraded suspension. And I actually think he's done some mods on his engine. He seemed to be riding my tail all the time. Bryce Stevens of the BDR team is a backcountry enthusiast whose roots run deep within the backroads community. Bryce was an integral part of the scouting team and the work that is put into the mission even before it begins. As well, he recorded the GPS tracks to make this ride possible for future riders in the riding community. Bryce is riding a KTM 990 adventure that's been giving him a little bit of trouble even before we begin. Tom Myers of Turtec USA has a company deep-seated in the adventure motorcycle market. They provide travelers with all the necessities to make traveling possible on a motorcycle. Tom is an avid outdoors enthusiast and a great addition to have on any backcountry expedition. Tom is riding a BMW 1200 GS, the largest motorcycle on our trip. Justin Bradshaw of Butler Motorcycle Maps is an experienced motorcyclist on and off the road. One of his duties at Butler Maps is to ride every road in the U.S. and document it for mapping. When Justin isn't riding for work, you'll find him on the track road racing his Ducati 1098. But for this trip, he slowed it down a little on a KTM 990 Adventure R, his off-road motorcycle of choice. Justin Summers of Climb USA trades in his snowmobile for two wheels. As a dirt bike enthusiast, he needs no introduction to the terrain, but riding a much larger bike might have some challenging outcomes. Justin is riding a brand new KTM 990 Adventure, kitted out just for this journey. Let's see if we can't get a few scratches on it. John Beck, an accomplished photographer and off-road rider, joins the crew to document this trip. Wielding a 40-pound backpack full of camera gear and still keeping up with the rest of the group, John captures the Utah backcountry frame by frame. 
Out of his handful of motorcycles, John has chosen his KTM 950 for this adventure. Joe Lloyd of Curbside Productions is making his transition from on to off-road travel. An experienced rider having ridden a BMW F800GS on the ice roads of northern Canada, the idea of Utah was appealing to him because of the drastic change of scenery. With much success riding his F800GS, Joe elected to stay with the BMW brand and then trash it while riding through Lockhart. And I'm Rob Watt of Trailmaster Adventures and Butler Maps. My role was to pre-ride the entire route and lead the group on this adventure. My passion is anywhere there are dirt roads and anywhere I can test my crash bar bags designed for the KTM or BMW motorcycles, I'm there. I'm riding a KTM 990 adventure outfitted to ride in the rugged country of Utah. The first part of the route begins just outside Mexican Hat and travels a meandering pathway through the Valley of the Gods. Well, after concluding the Washington backcountry discovery route, uh, uh, talking with the team about states that were uh, what we'd consider epic and uh, also ones that we understood a little bit. I've spent a lot of time in Utah and uh, it was just a natural second choice. It's a gorgeous state. I have a little bit of background knowledge on it and figured I could put together a pretty good route. So gathering up a lot of maps and doing a bunch of research, uh, I came up with an, an initial route for us to, to work from and it's been through several iterations since then. The Valley of the Gods. The sight of legendary western movies and iconic sandstone towers makes for a perfect start to our day. We did Washington last summer and it was a fantastic project. We wanted to keep doing it in other states and the debate was pretty short. We decided that Utah was going to be the next one because all of us have been down here hiking, backpacking, mountain biking and riding motorcycles and we just knew you can't beat the landscapes and the, the geography down here, and so it was, uh, it was our top choice. This area is considered a photographer's playground with such expansive views and incredible photo ops. I'm looking forward to seeing what's beyond Moab. I've been to Moab, I've driven to Moab from Seattle, and that's the only bit of the state that I know. And I know there's so much here, there's so many different landscapes and so many different microclimates that I just am excited to see all of them. I'm excited to see everything that's, that's not just the slick rock that I've seen in Moab. The valley gives way to a steep cliff face and the Moki Dugway reveals itself. 
the steep gravel road ascends 1100 feet in three miles. It is a graded dirt switchback road that is carved into the face of the cliff edge of Cedar Mesa. This road was originally built to accommodate the uranium ore trucks of the 1950s. The overlook at the top gives a breathtaking view of the Valley of the Gods and the distant buttes of Monument Valley. For me personally, uh, what I'm really excited about on the Utah Backcountry Discovery Route is that, um, that we're going to have five, six days of actually camping out and, uh, and going cross country and seeing you know, uh, things that I'll see again or maybe that I missed the, sec the first time I was out scouting. Um, so just getting out in the backcountry and, and camping for that long, because normally when I do adventure rides, We'll camp maybe a couple nights and, and stay in motels. So doing this one, there you really don't have the luxury of motels in a lot of places. So you really do have to camp, and uh, and it makes it interesting to me. Snow Flat Road follows part of the old Mormon Pioneer Trail that traveled west to the San Juan Mission. A collection of compacted sand, dirt, and slick rock make it a fun and fast road to enjoy. Although, when wet, the road is sure to be a nightmare to traverse. Well, the terrain uh, obviously is is one of a kind. I've, I've fortunately had the opportunity to ride a, a lot of places um, uh, around the world, and I, there's very little that can you can compare to this. So the terrain, first of all, the the weather this time of year is perfect to be doing this, and the idea of being able to explore a trans-state route um, is a it's a rapidly diminishing frontier. I'm not sure how much longer, with land closures and all this sort of opportunity, is going to be there. But, so I'm just glad to have the opportunity to see this now, knowing it's here, and, and uh, explore it with people that, that uh, have share similar values, similar interests. The idea that inspired me to ride these backcountry discovery routes was Oregon. Some, uh, some guys in Oregon made one for their state in uh, 1999, and I rode that. That was a long time ago, you know, that was 12 years ago. And uh, we thought that really every state needs one of these. And uh, so we started to create these. We made one for Washington, that's the first one. Utah is the second. And they're not, you know, by all means, they're not the only way to get across the state. They're just one way. And uh, it's non-commercial. 
We, we create the route and we sell the map, we sell a DVD, but we give away the tracks and it's just so that everybody can do it. All of that stuff is part of the experience, right? I mean, being out in the desert is an incredible experience and being out on a bike is, is even better. I've, I've ridden actually around the world on my motorcycle. I spent almost four months a few years ago riding around the world, so I've been to probably 50 countries. Uh, and I always keep looking back to this place. This is one of my favorite places in the entire world. The landscape is so unique. Everything about it just uh, really, really hits home for me. I really enjoy it out here. You know, me personally, I just, I like anything to do with riding. You know, and so if there's an adventure and we can go ride, you know, whatever it is, I'm in. So I really enjoy getting out on the bike and spending time in the outdoors. The team faces some deep silt sand before heading up Butler Wash to find camping for the night. If time allows you, the Butler Wash provides numerous opportunities to visit archaeological sites including rock art and large alcove cave dwellings. Since this was our first day of riding, we stopped and set up our camp a little early. Plus, we found an ideal place in the cottonwood trees to try out our new tents and gear. My concern was to find out who snored and pitch my tent far away from that person. Or should I say, Paul. In my own planning, I opted to be self-sufficient with enough freeze-dried meals to get me through the journey. While I may not be feasting like a king, the freeze-dried option does the trick, as well as providing my companions with an endless source of amusement. I have lovely granola with milk and blueberries. Mmm, look at how good that looks. These guys are having bacon and pancakes and eggs florentine, yet this is camping right here, right here. Wait a minute. His favorite part, I think, was uh, coming into that sh uh, sh some of that sugar sand and uh, just letting go of the bars and shooting through it straight like it was pavement like just wiggling a little bit below me, but just going straight. After stocking up on some food, water, and fuel in the town of Blanding, we head west out of the desert to the pine trees of Elk Ridge. This certainly is a change of scenery from the red desert terrain.
This is a fun and fast road. Be sure to stop and enjoy the views. road was just like a roller coaster there was washes there was rocks there was sand which was a little scary but it was just an absolute hoot to ride it was really fun We make our way onto the ridge tops and start to encounter rain. On these roads in Utah, rain can stop your progress altogether. The clay surface of these roads can turn a relatively easy road into an extremely difficult and dangerous surface to ride, and especially if you're on a loaded adventure bike. I'd say that I was following Justin on that section we were filming, and he was in front of me and he started to get sideways and he just whacked the throttle. He just pounded the gas, and it made things worse. His back end swung around super fast, and he just shot off into the ditch, and then he somehow ended up like on his back in the motorcycle. His front wheel was like laying on his head, and he did a little spin move, and then popped out from underneath the front wheel of his motorcycle with his whole entire side just totally brown, just covered with mud. It was awesome. It is treacherous. It, it might be one of the most difficult things to navigate on a big adventure bike, any bike for that matter. Oh, really? It's slick mud. And these clay roads up here, when it rains even just a little bit, I, we didn't even feel rain today, just a couple drops. And uh, it was enough to turn the roads into slick snot. So the key is not to gun it like I did, trying to straighten myself out when you get cross threaded. You want to be, uh, you want to be controlled and methodical about working your way through mud, and you got to be careful. It, it it is so slick, and it's everywhere up here. So it's fun. We had we had a good time. We actually went back and forth across a few mud holes just just to be boys and slide around in it, but. It's a, it's a challenge, it's a chore for sure. My favorite part of the day, without question, my favorite part of this entire journey so far was the mud. The mud we were going through was great, you sort of had to paddle through it, you could get on your pegs for a bit and give it a bit and then your front washes out, but it was just so much fun and it's so much fun to see the team come together and, you know, do what we got to do to get through it. So, I really enjoyed that and I kind of hope we see a little more of it, but I won't say that too loud because that will detract from our schedule, but hopefully we see more mud. John's host. What happened to John? His is absolutely locked up. It's um, the the mud has kicked in so tight his, his wheel won't spin. I mean, won't spin. Well, the mud is clogged up in the fender, 
I you can see it's already pulled away from the forks. Out of the it way builds up to the point that it actually locks the wheel and the wheel can't rotate. So basically it turns the bike into a big ski. The least favorite part of today would probably be my front wheel locking up and having to disassemble the fender and go through all that drama. Here's what you got to work with. We've got cruise tools, kit, standard issue, bailing wire, and a lot of zip ties. We've got more than that if you need them, but... I, I got a bailing wire under the seat too, so okay. we got extra of that. Um, first, you know what, let me see first if I can pump up the brake enough to get... Can I put something in there or just, or just do no, it? No, just, just pump it. Yeah. Favorite part of the day is probably waking up and knowing that you've got a whole day to look forward to on the bikes in remote Utah. Getting into camp, the team discusses their favorite and least favorite parts of the day. Man, I'm not in the office. How can I have a least favorite part of the day? I'm on a bike. You were smiling all day, so. My phone's been dead all day. <laughs> yeah. My favorite part of the day was making it through that one. That was the best part. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to try out where my tent's laying down. That it's, yeah, yeah, that's where I want to lay. Well, another day in the books another perfect camp spot. Our route is going to take us through the Abajo mountain range and eventually into the Canyonlands. The Abajos are also called the Blue Mountains, and this is the first time we start to ride through some beautiful aspen groves. Well, we're located right now up in the Abajo Mountains, east of Monticello, Utah, and the elevation is just over 10,000 feet here, and it's about 50 degrees out. Uh, this is a, a very high mountain range in the corner of the southeast. Uh, part of the state and uh, just a, a stunning contrast to the uh, slick rock and, and the uh, sand we've been riding through. It's been a, a cool damp ascent up uh, this stunning road over here. And we've gone through uh, cool aspen uh, groves and the lights shining through, it's been stunning. Leaving the Abajo mountain range behind, we seek out newspaper rock, which yet again is another change in our landscape. The 200 square foot rock is a part of the vertical Wingate sandstone cliffs that enclose the upper end of the Indian Creek Canyon. I don't know much about newspaper rock, however, that is where we are at Newspaper Rock, and it's just a very short detour from the official Utah BDR route. But it's worth a trip. It's only a couple miles. You come down in towards Indian Creek, and there's some really, really neat petroglyphs here. Some of the best preserved ones that I know about. Consulting the map, we elect to take the expert only leg through Lockhart Basin. Instead of going on the main route, up and over LaSalle Pass and into Moab. Yeah. 
Lockhart Basin should be considered an expert-only route, or a route you don't take alone. It's a 78-mile trip to Moab, but it's grueling, yet a beautiful trip. Take what water you think you need, and then double it. There are no bailouts, and it's a seldom-traveled road. So be self-sufficient, and you'll have a good time. What's an adventure ride without a little rock meeting some metal? Obviously plenty of rocks around here. The lever hit a rock, bent it up, and uh, during the repair process broke it clean off. So. Actually, coming across Lockhart Basin. Lockhart Basin is an incredible spot. It's uh, it's tough, uh, but it gives you a challenge. It gets your heart going, and you're kind of like, "Wow, I made this!" And kind of like the mud yesterday, where the mud was a challenge, and it got your heart going. And uh, Lockhart Basin did the same. But you know, even going over the, the uh, Bajos was absolutely beautiful through the aspen trees. A tired group ends the day just in time for darkness. While packing up our tents, several of the riders discussed their aches and pains from the technical riding from yesterday, only to hear from me that we still have roughly 35 miles of riding some challenging terrain. So leaving our stunning campsite in this iconic landscape, we make our way towards Hurrah Pass with a little bit of adrenaline, but a big smile on our face. This one lane pass clings on the side of the red rock, but everyone is making their way just fine.
Approaching Moab, the Colorado River welcomes us and again signifies another distinct change in our journey northward. Once we restock our food and water in Moab, we head up Sand Flat Road to Polar Mesa, getting a great view of Castle Valley. Though, Paul seems to be having a bit of trouble with his motorcycle. I think it maybe is a side stand switch or something. I'm going to pull the seat off and see if I can find any wires that are pinched or anything like that. It could also be a battery connection. Though we still see red rock formations, barren landscape has given away to more greenery as we descend into Onion Creek and look for our campsite for the evening. It's days like this that make us all love adventure riding. We've crossed technical sections of Lockhart Basin and Hurrah Pass enjoyed impressive views of the Colorado River, and finally, the amazing Onion Creek. So earlier today, I had the power uh, cut on the bike. It, I kept, it was the ignition was going away, and I kept losing, losing the engine, and we suspected it was the side stand switch it's the switch that uh, keeps you from riding off with your side stand in the down side stand in the down position so taking it apart and it uh, it, it appears just to be a faulty switch so what I'm gonna do or what I did was uh, moved it around until I found a happy position where the bike will start with it in gear with the clutch in and I'm gonna duct tape it up wire it up and just kind of attach it up here so it's not going to be engaged with the side stand it'll be just out of the way altogether and hopefully it'll continue to work and if it doesn't, we'll have to cut wires and tie some wires together. But this is the least, inv least invasive way to solve the problem at this point. So hopefully it works. Yeah, Tom uh, was concerned the duct tape would fall off. I didn't clean it with something. So I stole a little bit of John Beck's Knob Creek when he wasn't looking and cleaned, uh, cleaned this off. So hopefully the duct tape will stick to it. Everything's totally coated with mud and with dust right now. So. The adhesive on the duct tape was likely to just fall off, so a little whiskey cleaning uh, did the trick. I think it was still dark out, and I thought I'd better get up and try not to be the last person out of camp again. So we're trying to make up some time. Going to try and get on the road by 7.30 or 8 this morning. So uh, got an early start. Onion Creek is our last chance to enjoy the unique red rock formations, and the landscape doesn't disappoint. Onion Creek Road crisscrosses the creek several times through an impressive canyon section that is absolutely perfect for a morning ride.
After the past couple days of harder riding, the entire team was grateful for these smooth, fast roads, allowing the focus to shift from riding to enjoying the scenery. Just like that, the landscape has changed. Gone are the towering spires of red rock. In their places are vast, empty desert stretches. This is old mining country. about to take a road called Yellow Cat over to the interstate, Interstate 70 I believe it is. And at that point in time we'll ride a series of frontage roads and some dirt roads along the book cliffs and we will wind up ending in Green River and getting gas before heading through the center of the state on some uh, old railroad grades and dirt roads up to the town of Wellington. Traveling north from Green River, we go up the Cottonwood Wash Road. This road can be deceiving at times. What you think is a mild and easy road can have some deep washouts caused by recent rains. The weather, taking a turn for the worst, has us rushing to escape the road we're on. It's a common theme, but the weather and the road surfaces change so rapidly in Utah, you just can't take any chances. Uh, we're on the a wash outside of um, Green River. We're headed north. We have a big storm that's coming up from behind, from the south. Uh, it's moving pretty quick. It's a large storm. Uh, and because I have a weather radar, this is a Zumo 665, I, ha I can see where it's going. Uh, and I strongly recommend anyone on the uh, Utah Backcountry Discovery Route have some either a smartphone with weather radar or a, any kind of a GPS device with weather radar so you don't get yourself in trouble. Then it's a bit of a speed run to get onto roads more suited to riding in the rain. In the afternoon before we all decided we didn't want to set up our tents in the rain and, and so we all chose to uh, stay in the motel. Uh, which was a great decision. We finally got to shower, clean up, do some laundry, and uh, which was uh, a great deal after being on the road for so long. Uh, morning we started off and went to um, Nine Mile Canyon, uh, where we saw some great, uh, I believe, Anasazi uh, petroglyphs on the on the walls. The team makes their way into the Nine Mile Canyon, a beautiful 70-mile stretch of backcountry byway. Actually, I prefer these to newspaper rock because they're a little bit 
you know, it's not fully natural. You've got a walkway and that, but you don't have a, a railing. You don't have a big sign. It's just sort of left as it would be over time. So I think it's a really interesting stop. The canyon holds the world's largest concentration of Native American rock art, dating back some 8,000 years. Argyle Canyon, uh, something I'd mention is that if that canyon is wet, absolutely do not attempt, attempt it because uh, it's muddy and you're going to have a hard time getting through it. Argyle Canyon is a smooth dirt road that takes you out of Nine Mile and up to Reservation Ridge. It's very adventure bike friendly when dry. But when wet, not so much. Unfortunately, because of the recent rains, the mud was too deep and slick on Reservation Ridge. So we had to hit the pavement and miss some fantastic 360 degree views along the ridge. That's the thing about adventure riding. You never know where your day will lead you, and that's a good thing. Again, Utah is showing its diversity. Ascending Heber Mountain Overlook and beyond, we're all amazed at the serene riding and beauty of Northern Utah. One of the cool things we saw in the high meadows above Current Creek were large herds of sheep. The sheep really didn't care we were there, but their guard dogs sure did. Getting near the end of the day, we ride down from Soapstone Basin and cross the Provo River. It's time to find a campsite. Traveling through the Wasatch National Forest, I spotted a small lake with a perfect camp spot. This spot, high above and near Washington Lake, ends up being one of the best camp spots of the entire journey. We're at high elevation, the sky is clear, and we're in for a cold night. A lot of the terrain that we rode today um, is, is a really, we got a really good, we're going to be able to give the viewer a really good idea of an area that they can go ride when they've just purchased that first adventure bike and maybe they you know they're really concerned about getting in over their head we have a lot of really great you know i wouldn't necessarily say real smooth but really nice easy rolling roads that you're able to get in the backcountry and see a lot of great vistas and a lot of great scenery Yeah, this morning was the coldest morning yet. I didn't really want to get out of bed. But luckily I could hear the fire crackling a little bit and I knew it was still burning from the night before. 
So I got out and uh, by the time I got out of, out of my tent, it was roaring. After clearing the frost from our bikes, we head out only to run into 200 yards of baby head rocks. It's a tough way to start the day, but we all got through with a little help from everyone. Leaving this morning and getting right into baby heads right at the start wasn't a whole lot of fun. Usually I like to warm up a little bit before I go into that stuff. and. Uh, I was glad when we got through that. I was sweating and, and it was 9,600 feet, so I was uh, huffing and puffing. But then it got really mellow, got really beautiful, hit a lot of good solid dirt roads, good paved roads. We head back into the pine and aspen trees and follow a great two-track type road over to Seven Tree Flat. On this side of the state, the limited public land makes it near impossible not to cross into Wyoming. The group makes a quick detour to stop in Evanston and continue on, finding a secluded campsite deep in the pine forest. A wet and soggy finish to the end of Utah doesn't dampen the spirits of the crew as they look forward to a chance for a hot shower and some home comfort. The final section takes off from Highway 39 and heads north along the Monte Cristo Ridge, then crossing Log Cabin Ridge and finally through the South Sink. Once again, the abnormal heavy rains kept us from riding the last section along the Monte Cristo Range. This area is known for some great camping with beautiful views. Well, the end's in sight. The riding is swift and it's all on our minds. Get to Bear Lake so we can say we've completed the Utah Backcountry Discovery Route.
With the view of Bear Lake in the distance, the group has a great sense of accomplishment as Utah is seen in the rear view. As the riders look back on the highs and lows of their journey, they think about the varied landscape that Utah has to offer, from the high mountains of the Abajos to the fierce and rugged terrain of Lockhart Basin. You know, the people in Utah, as we travel through there, you know, I'm familiar with, you know, I've spent some time in Utah, and as you can tell by the number of Rec you know, the backcountry roads and the recreation you see around you. You know, they're really open to this kind of recreation and um, they really encourage it. We read in magazines about these great trips people do to Central America, across South America, Africa, and that's great, but why can't you do this in the United States? And the answer is, of course, you can. I think the northern part of the state, for me, is really something. You know, when we when we come over Reservation Ridge, and um, and then start climbing up uh, into the higher country, uh, it's it's beautiful. You know, and you get some rock, and you get a little bit of technical, but yet it's just these beautiful vistas and and scenery that you you don't get. You know, in a lot of other places. This is really a passion of mine, the dual sport stuff and the off-road stuff, like I said, because I think a lot of people want to get out there and explore. They just don't have the resources or the confidence. So that's what we're giving them is both of those things, the resource through a map and the confidence to know that I can go here and I can be all right. I loved Utah. I absolutely loved Utah. I didn't know what to expect going in. I've seen the same photos everybody else has. You see the arches, you see Valley of the Gods, you see all these things and magnificent, perfect photographs. And uh, I knew, that I took that with a grain of salt thinking, you know, that's on one day out of the year, but really Utah did offer that picture perfect scenery almost every day. You know, I, I think my favorite part of, of doing this discovery route was I, I, I've spent a lot of time riding in Utah, but we, I saw a lot of new country that I've never, that I've never ridden. You know, particularly once we got um, north of Wellington, a lot of that side of Utah, um, I haven't spent any time in that area. There's a lot of high elevation stuff and some really neat stuff back there. So I think since that was new territory for me, you know, that was, you know, that was a fun part. As a photographer, it's always you know fantastic to be dropped in environments like this where you can really exercise you know any sort of creativity to pull what you can out of the landscape. And we've got virtually endless scenery to work with. It's a, you know it's a great experience. And I expected that the rest of Utah would be either like Moab or sagebrush desert. And I was really pleased to get up in the mountains and find, you know, large aspen forests and uh, evergreens and these high mountain passes and high mountain meadows. You know, I, I think as far as the group that we, that we rode with, I think there was, I mean, I think everyone brought a lot of strengths to the table and Rob had definitely put a lot of work into um, scouting the trails especially some of the washed out ones that Joe liked particularly. But. We left Needles Outpost uh, and got on the road. The scenery right, well the whole day was amazing, but right then it really started to get into sort of that, that amazing desert landscape with the distinct rock formations that let you know, you know you're not in LA anymore. 
and it was that all the way through until we found that campsite and then the next morning was the uh, technical portion of Lockhart Basin. So that whole day was just fantastic. Utah is, uh, you're dealing with a high elevation, the whole state's at high elevation, but the mountain passes are, are up to 10,000 or more. And rain is always a possibility. And if it rains, I can tell you that throughout the state, a lot of the roads are not passable. Uh, and I mean not passable. So you can't even consider continuing your trip until the roads dry out. So you really have to do your research uh, before you come, check the weather, find out what the road conditions are, and, um, and know that before you come. It's going to be tough to run this thing from, from border to border in, one, in, in just one constant trip. I think you're going to have rain delays and maybe have to take some alternate routes around things that, that are muddy. The other uh, backcountry discovery routes we've done, we just ran them from start to finish. The rain didn't have any impact on it, and typically it doesn't rain this time of year on, on the other routes that we've done. So this one is, is a little bit different in that sense. I think the, the nine days we took to do the UTBDR is an acceptable time frame if you're not filming. It was tight for us filming because we're much slower when we film. But I think if you're, if you're sitting there at home, you know, and you're planning, I'm going to do the UTBDR, give yourself some time. Nine days is reasonable for this trip, but, but that should be thought of as ideal conditions. And it also assumes that you get to camp maybe a little later in the day. Everybody's going to stop and take photos and rest. you got to refuel the bikes. There are just so many things that happen through the day that, that suck time away from the, the route. And yeah, nine days it should be a goal, but it definitely should not be assumed you'll do it in nine days. Might even be able to do it in less than that. It depends on the rider, depends on a lot of things, uh, a small group versus a large group. The thing that had the biggest impact on me was, was getting to know another state. Utah has, has so much. I'd, I'd only been to Moab and, and that's what Utah was in my mind, but now I've seen there are numerous passes over 10,000 feet. There are fir trees and landscapes that are just like we have back in Washington in the northern part of the state. Uh, and there's just so much variety here. And I feel like I can now say, I know Utah. I've seen a whole bunch of the different landscapes and the small towns. You know, I, I think the biggest thing for me and after looking back on this trip we just had is um, there's a lot of freedom in just loading up your motorcycle with with everything you need to survive in the backcountry and be comfortable and have what you need to just ride and when you get to a spot you want to stop you can stop. If you're planning to ride or drive the Utah backcountry discovery route here are a few things to consider. This backcountry route follows remote roads and high elevation passes. The best season is from July through September, though many stretches can be ridden year-round depending on the current weather. The route is approximately 871 miles long and can be done comfortably in eight to nine days. Allow some time for unexpected weather and the possibility that parts of the route may not be passable due to weather. Utah is known for quickly forming storms that can destroy roads. There are many camping options and hotels along the route as well as food and gas at Bluff, Blanding, Monticello, LaSalle, Moab, Green River, Wellington, Duchesne, Camas, Evanston, and Woodruff. Gas and basic provisions are also available at Mexican Hat, Needles Outpost, Thompson Springs, and Soldier Summit. The longest stretch without fuel is 180 miles. If you haven't already picked up a Butler Utah Backcountry Discovery Route Map, they are available at Butler Maps, Turatec USA, and several of our fine sponsor locations. GPS tracks and additional information are available at www.utbdr.com. Many areas along the route do not have cell phone coverage. A satellite phone is recommended or a personal location device such as a spot. Have fun! Be safe and enjoy the ride.